half hour on this argument when nobody's ever going to see it. So, um, so I decided to start a blog using Blogspot, and I haven't upgraded it, and I haven't done anything like I should have. But uh, my readership has steadily increased. People seem to like what I have to say, and uh, as you know, as was mentioned, um, I'm, I'm getting close to about two million page views a year. I believe it is the most popular Zionist blog, certainly the most popular one that only one person runs. Um, how I have the time, people ask me, that I can't answer. I have no idea how I have the time to do this. But, uh, and, and, I, and again, I just started a new job, and that's like, uh, you know, so it's, I'm not quite, I'm not doing quite as much detailed stuff as before. I'm doing a little bit more linking, but, uh, you know, it, I found out that sleep is, is really overrated, so, uh, you know, it works. So, at any rate, the, um, my blogging goals, is, uh, you know, as I make things up, I do want to be accurate. Number one really is accuracy. You have to be credible and you have to be, everything you say has to be right. If, uh, as, as soon as you make a mistake, that's it. You're down the drain. And uh, I believe, again, I'm, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging over here, but uh, I believe that in many ways my standards are higher than most journalists as far as figuring out what's right. I will, uh, too many times you'll see a journalist will just, uh, like for example, there'll be a, a poll comes out, Palestinian poll from the uh, you know, Palestinian Center for Policy and Research or whatever. And they'll come out with a abstract saying, here's what the poll says. And uh, people will just publish, the, you know, the newspapers will say, oh, look at this, here's what it says, the Palestinians really want peace, blah, blah, blah. And I'll actually look at the poll. I'm gonna spend the extra 10 minutes to actually find the poll, download it, look at the questions, look how they, how they were phrased, look at what the answers are. And I'm going to say, oh, look at this. There's a little bit over here that they didn't really talk about. There's a little bit over here. Like, so look back at the original sources is one of the things I really like to do, to see if things are really accurate or not. Sometimes I get it wrong. Sometimes I'll rely on the, on the journalists and then find out that it's not true. Um, but, uh, but generally, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just, you know, for me, I just want to make sure everything is right and, uh, and accurate. But I also want to keep things entertaining. Um, I do use humor a bit, a lot of sarcasm. Uh, sometimes people complain about that, but uh, you can get a lot of information out of a single sarcastic comment. Um, it's, uh, you know, as far as uh, bandwidth is concerned, it's a very high signal-to-noise ratio is when you, when you say something sarcastic. And sometimes you have no choice. I mean, it's like so many absurd things are happening. And I've been specifically following the Arab world. I've been spending, if people that read my blog know, that I will um, use Google Translate and translate Arabic articles and, uh, and use that to see how they really think. And that's really one of my really my goals, is to get inside the head of the Arab psyche. And it's not, you know, and I'm not right-wing, left-wing, I'm not anti-Arab, there's plenty of things, you know, there's plenty of stuff that Muslims I, I really do admire. There's a lot of stuff about Islam that isn't bad. Um, but when it comes to Israel, they really, really are, are you know, there's, there's no room for compromise, really, when it comes down to it. And uh, you, the only way you can know that is from reading it, and from reading it directly. When the, by the time the stuff gets into the Jerusalem Post, or gets, and certainly by the time it gets into AP, it gets watered down unrecognizable to what the original statements were, and what the original articles are. And it's important to see exactly how they write and what they're saying. Um, I posted something today from a Jordanian newspaper, talking about uh, the, the Jews that visited yesterday in Yom Yerushalayim. Um, you know, 30 Jews maybe visited the, the Harabayat, and they were walking around peacefully like they always do, and this Jordanian article in Ad-Dustur, the Constitution, was just talking about, you know, how disgusting it was, and, you know, and they're, they're doing a, a, the, the original the translation is orgy, somebody told me it's not quite right, but, you know, of, of the Jews defiling the mount, and their plan to destroy all of the Palestinians, and genocide, and, the, and it was just, like, so over the top, but by the time it gets to AP, they'll say, yeah, there's, there's disapproval, it's controversial, or something like that. It's just, you've got to see the original, it's really amazing. Um, but, but nevertheless, it's still humorous, because you've got to make fun of it, too. Because it's just like, these guys are freaking out over the fact that a few Jews are walking on top of the mountain that's the holiest site in the, in the world for them. And they're completely going crazy over that. So it's, it's important to have a little bit like that. Another entertaining thing, like today, again, just a, a silly example, but uh, in Lebanese newspapers, they uh, announced that uh, they found candy in a Palestinian refugee camp, right? Which was refugee in quotes. But they found candy in the camp that had Hebrew writing on it. So therefore, it was oh, this is, and they said this is the most dangerous thing that there's this, you know Hebrew letters are somehow in candy. It wasn't even candy; it was butter, or at least that's what the letters were saying. You know, it was Hebrew for tanuba butter. But uh, it, it was never. Like, this is insane, you know. So so there's a little bit of humor comes out um, comes in very handy. Um, informative. I really want to be uh, to teach people something. I don't want to just copy everything that it says in the Jerusalem Post and in, in, in Yedioda notes because you can read that. There's no reason. If I do put a post from that, it'll either be one that didn't seem to get any play or something that I think that I can add something to. 
Um, which brings up the next one, original. I really like to be original. I just, and again, it's my own psychology. I don't like to do what other people are doing. You know, if I see other bloggers are covering a topic, I'm generally going to stay away from it unless I think I have a, an original viewpoint or um, an, a different take on it. The, um, and I also, as I said, I, since I do look at the Arabic newspapers, I find I get scoops way before. You know, I, I have literally hundreds. Because I'll, you know, uh, there are plenty of articles that I, that I find and I, and I publicize that, that get out there before, and I, and I mentioned it before that people find out about it. Um, and you is unifying. I, I don't want to get into the inside baseball stuff. I, I, uh, and I have my opinion certainly, but there, there's so much of a consensus among, you know, between right and left wing Zionists, and I have fans from both sides. There's no reason that I have to, you know, get into things that are divisive. I want. You know, unity is important to me. I think, and it's, I think it's important to all of us. And uh, there's enough stuff that we have in common that we can talk about. And you know, again, judging from my fans, I think that it works. Um, sometimes why? Um, you sometimes you really have do have to get emotional. My blog is fairly um, logical. It's uh, it, I generally do do the uh, you know the Dershowitz type arguments, and that's the thing you know, like like Noah was saying. And uh, you know, I'll do the debates and I'll do the fisking and things like that. Occasionally, you want to get into uh, emotion, and when it comes down to it, though, emotions are really what the, what what drives everything. And this is why I've said, and I've said this in the past, and it's going to sound weird. My blog, I don't think, is good Hasbara, because good Hasbara is emotional. The way people's minds are changed are emotional. It's something that happens to them that's visceral, that have, that they experience something that includes all of their senses. When Barry says that her entire life, you know, towards Israel changed from seeing a film, um, you know, about Columbia University. There's a reason it was a film and it wasn't an article. It was highly unlikely if she would have read it that the same thing would have happened. It's uh, when things, you know, and, and, and we'll talk about it a little bit more later, but it's, uh, but the, these things are, you know, logic is one thing, it's very nice and it's supportive and it makes us feel good since we're already on the right side and it helps uh, the people that are already pro-Israel think, okay, uh, you know, now, I, now I, I knew that this was wrong, but now I can understand a little bit better why. So that's, that's, that's important, but in the end, it doesn't convince people. We're not going to convince people from, uh, you know, Jewish Voices for Peace based on my blog. It's just not going to happen. It's going to be, it can happen, but it can happen in other ways. The other side does use the weapon of emotion far more than we do, and it's something we really need to do far more of. Their, their entire arguments are emotional. They're, you know, oh, al Quds, Jerusalem, refugees, pain, displacement, murder, you know, genocide. That's their, you know, that's it. This is their, uh, but that's, you know, but it, it strikes a chord. You know, you have the key. Wonderful, you have the key from, you know, from the house that was abandoned or that whatever they ran away from or they were kicked out from or whatever they want to say. That's, uh, you know, they, symbolism is what's more important to them. They don't care about the arguments. They're, they're, that's not what it is. Everything comes out to be symbolism. And when they come up with the arguments, it's only to give some sort of an intellectual veneer on their arguments. But in the end, their arguments are no good. It doesn't matter because they have the emotion on their side. So, okay, I'll, I'm going to skip this. We already mentioned about the credibility. But, uh, but what works? And uh, is there's, again, there's no magic formula to determine what's going to go viral. So yeah, I have a, the nice part about having the blog and owning it and having every piece of it is that I can, I can use it as a laboratory. I can see what sort of things make people tweet, what sort of things make people uh, like me on Facebook. And, uh, and, and it's interesting. You know, you, I can see what, what works and what doesn't. So just to give an example. Um, my, my most popular post for sure are my posters for Apartheid Week, if, if, if those of you haven't seen it. It generally it went viral. I mean, that literally went viral. It ended up being on, uh, on uh, you know, people were sending it around in emails. It ended up being used in, in people's counter demonstrations for Israel Apartheid Week. Um, you know, it, was, it really went out all over the place. Essentially what I did was I took the, um, you know, pictures of prominent Arab Israelis in, uh, in politics and entertainment and sports. and, I, and in, ones that are clearly, you know, popular in Israel, and, and wrote, just put the, the question mark, you know, apartheid, as a question mark underneath it. And it was a series, about 20 posters, 25 posters. And it really struck a chord. I did specifically for Israel Apartheid Week, because I just wanted to show in a single poster how the accusation of apartheid is ridiculous. Um, so that's by far was the most popular thing I did. Um, the second thing just happened to be the, the Gabriel Lagner speech. I don't know if you remember this, but uh, in um, Cambridge University, I believe, during, there was a debate if, uh, is Israel a rogue state? And Latner was arguing that it is a rogue state, but it was argued he gave a pro-Israel argument. And because it was just so unusual, a lot of people ended up really uh, appreciating that. For some reason, people really love to look up on Google about Victoria Beckham's tattoo, 
and uh, this, this stupid article I wrote, you know, in 2009. But the, but it also it points out that you know even within the pro-Israel community, we're nothing compared to you know what the New York Times is doing, what the Huffington Post is doing. There's no way my blog is going to get that big because it is a tiny topic. So that just it just teaches you the number of people that are just happen to be asking about what Victoria Beckham's tattoo looks like, and my uh, my result comes up as one of the top five. I end up I still get hundreds a month from this, this stupid. Um, what, what did it look like? Wait, what's the yeah, no, it has Hebrew on it. It, it had some Hebrew. Uh, it had a pasuk, and, and it was. Uh, and, and David Beckham had a had a, a similar one. So okay, fine. Um, there's a one that happened earlier this year. It was very popular. Was uh, and actually just mentioned in the IDF blog the other day. Is there was a uh, a viral picture. You know, went around so showing a soldier seeming to step on a girl, and in a lot of uh, Arab sites or anti-Israel sites, it was saying, "Hey, look, this is how Israeli soldiers." Um, treat their, you know, the Palestinians. And uh, luckily, I, when I first put it up, I didn't know the actual story. I said, this is going viral. Clearly, from judging from the gun and the uniform, it's not true. My guess is that it's some sort of a street theater. And uh, it turns out I was 100% right. Somebody wrote to me, and they found the actual picture, and I posted it up immediately. And uh, then everybody went, wow, this is really something. Because it was a street theater, I think in Bahrain or something. <laughs> but it was, uh, they were showing, hey, here's how Israel acts. You know, the guy had a little cardboard Israeli flag on his thing, but it's cropped out on the picture. And, uh, and that's what it was, and then this picture was going around. So, however, there's something more interesting. I also make videos, or I'll post up other people's videos. <laughs> Earlier this year, and again, this wasn't a huge thing, but it ended up being the, the biggest thing I've ever done, is uh, somebody wrote to me, again, it, 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 it's nice to have fans, somebody wrote to me that there was a shampoo commercial in Turkey that used Hitler, as a, like, as a jokey type way. And I, I was fairly offended by this, you know, not, not tremendously offended, but I thought it was offensive. So I made a little video because I downloaded it from the site and I put my own comments around it. And uh, this story did go viral. This one, you know, ended up going you know, the wire services. I ended up reading about it in the Arabic media too. It was uh, it was literally all over the place. Um, Mavi Marmara. As soon as it, like the morning after the uh, the raid happened, um, I found you know Israeli TV. I found some uh, video showing the s soldier being stabbed. I immediately put up on YouTube. People go to YouTube to find out their news. And they just type in Mavi Marmara, and mine was the first one, 180,000 uh, hits. Which is, again, these are 10 times higher than any of my blog posts. Um, I made a jokey video about the Gaza Mall, the humanitarian crisis of the Gaza Mall, um, saying, you know, so, which, with sad music and saying, you know, oh, these, uh, you know, these poor Gazans are forced to uh, wait in the demeaning lines in order to buy their, you know, their shoes. And uh, you know, was showing pictures of them waiting with their nice shoes. The uh, it was just a, it was a, it, it went well. People liked it, but also it was immediate. It was very quickly after the news came out from the Gaza Mall. The other one interesting I just want to mention is um, the last one I didn't make myself. It was uh, made by the Yesha Council, just showing the importance of Judea and Samaria, and um, called Two Minutes on the Land of Israel. It was just a, an animation, and I just translated it. You know, I actually I didn't translate it myself. Somebody sent me hey, here's a translation, and I just made a video. And I asked them, you know, why didn't they do it? It took me an hour to put the thing up. Why didn't they do it? But again, that was also a fairly popular thing. So when you look at these things together, what makes something popular? So it has to be timely. Like I said, the Mavi Marmara was timely. Um, it, it, you know, original, obviously. Quality, hopefully. Um, something that's unexpected or ironic is important. But visceral is really the important thing. And I'm going to go off a little bit more on this. I hope I'm not going too much over. But uh, the, um, when it comes down to it, video goes right into your subconscious. Um, music goes right into your subconscious. Live performance will do that. The, uh, and, and I didn't really, and that's really what's important. It's, it's getting the emotions going. It's not the text. It's not the arguments. And, and I didn't really hit me until this morning, but when it comes down to it, when you think people say, you know, why, why is birthright, you know, successful? The reason is because it's immersive. It uses all the senses. That's, you know, that's what makes people pro-Israel. They're living there, they see it, they see what's going on. Even more than birthright, I would argue, is um, there are a number of high school programs that, you know, that an entire semester is spent in Israel. You know, people will see what's going on. That is the way to get the message across. And it's especially when they're younger. You know, because by the time they're already 18, 19, people's personalities are already set. People already, you know, have their opinions. They're, uh, they're already stubborn because they're sure their opinions are right. And, uh, and it's, it takes a rare type of person to change their mind after that. The, you've got to get to the stuff. It has to be done really on this visceral level. It doesn't, and it doesn't have to be you know, directly about Israel. Uh, one of the, my, my uh, commenters, I thought said a brilliant thing. 
she said what, we, what Israel needs is a romance novel where the big muscular you know, guy is an Israeli. And, uh, and that's just it. It's, just a, it's peripherally Israeli. It won't be the entire six. Right? Yeah, so, well, Exodus is for sure the Not best Hasbara ever done. You know, both the movie and the book. Because, and, what's that? Now it has to be a vampire. Right, yeah. So, but it's uh, now that now the Jews are the vampires. But, but it's uh, the but but this that's the thing. You know, in other words, these things work subconsciously, and that's what makes people pro-Israel. I mean, it's not the arguments. I might be good at the arguments. I love fisking. It's great. It's a lot of fun, and then people say, "Oh, you did a good job. Wonderful." But it doesn't change people's minds. If a person, when they're you know, when they're not expecting it, all of a sudden is like, "Wow, I empathize with this character." Um, and this could have been me. It's somebody who's like me, and it happens to be Israeli, or it happens to be pro-Israel, something like that. That is far more effective than anything we can do on a blog. It's uh, you know that, that's the stuff. You know, in my opinion, yes, negative is good. If we're doing politics, it's good. But if you do a pro-Israel message, we have to work more on the things that are visceral that actually gets in people's heads. Make video games, you know, from the IDS perspective, you know, what, uh, things like that. Just you know, we have to think in those terms, not so much in you know in terms of Arguing, yeah, yeah, we, because of Talmud, we're great at arguing, wonderful, but it doesn't help. So, uh, that's, uh, that's my, that's what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs>